Luke chapter 5, I invite you to turn your Bibles with me. And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret, uh, the Sea of Galilee, and saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draught. And Simon answered, answer and said unto him, Master, we have toiled all night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes and their net break. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships, so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knee, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man. It is never an easy task to speak to God's people. Uh, we have a diverse congregation with different needs and different desires and different yearnings. And it is only as the Holy Spirit gives utterance that we can satisfy all the needs and have God speak directly to us. As I look at this story, I realize that each one of us at some point or the other can see or relate to this particular situation. Number one, at some point in your life, you must have had fish to eat. And so you know the importance of fishing. Am I right? We realize that fishermen are very, very important people in our society. Because unless they go out on that boat, we will have no clue as to what we will eat when it comes on to our fish diet. For, for those of you from the Caribbean, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Because there is nothing like sitting down for a meal of, of, of goat fish. You have snapper fish. You have ranchman. Anybody knows what I'm talking about? Yes. And then a meal of parrot fish. Or, 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 or doctor fish. To make some nice fish tea. Or fish soup. I, I don't know if I'm losing the, the audience. But, but, um, but there's nothing like sitting down on a Sunday morning or a Sunday evening and eating a good plate of fish. And this forms the background to our, our story. These were career fishermen. They knew what it meant to eat fish and festival. And if they didn't have festival back then, I'm sure they must have had some nice white steamed rice to go along with that fish. And if they didn't have fish, I, I'm, I'm sure they knew about dumplings to go along with the fish. And if you don't have dumpling, you have some bus up shot. But fish goes along with just about any meal. Am I right? Yes. And if you don't have anything, you eat fish by itself, you're good to go. We have fry fish steam fish, roast fish, fish in any form is fish. And this is the background to our story. We find that Peter 
was at a problematic point, the disciples were very, very distraught. John the Baptist had just been killed by the authorities and they were at a point where they were very, very sad. They were down and they decided that they would go back to what they knew best, that of fishing. Now, they were out on the open sea. They didn't have engines back then, just so that you're clear. They had to row, row, row their boat all the way out. They had to cast that net. They didn't have comfort of being in their bed at night. They were out on the open waters. What a life. What a life. They were on the open waters all night. I just imagine that they must have spoken about their lives and what was happening and how hard work was and what had happened to John the Baptist and whether or not he was really the forerunner of Jesus and all of that stuff. But as morning came and they pulled in their nets, they realized that there was nothing in there. What a sad situation. You work all week for an employer that you don't really like. And at the end of the week, he tells you, you know what? I have no money to pay you. That is when you see Seventh-day Adventists become unlike Seventh-day Adventists. But these men were taking a chance. They owed the sea nothing and the sea owed them nothing. They pulled up their net and they rowed back to shore. Like good fishermen, they didn't just put down their nets, they were washing their net. Because a good fisherman makes sure that he washes his net before he puts it away. Ready for the following night when they will go back and do the same thing all over again. The Bible tells us, however, that while they're washing their nets, a crowd gathers. Because anywhere Jesus is, people are attracted. People want to be where Jesus is. If you're a Seventh-day Adventist and nobody wants to be around you, there's a problem. There's a problem. The crowd gets so big by the water side that they decide that they need to, Jesus needs a pulpit. You can't be on the same level when the crowd is so thick. And so he gets, he asks Peter, can I use your boat? Peter says, sure. He moves off a bit and he starts preaching to the crowd. I can imagine he tells them that they must keep their faith strong because even though they're going through tough times, tough times don't last, but tough people do. He tells them that they need to stick to it because Jesus is here for a reason and that in time, he will allow everything to work out in their favor. And as he preaches the sermon, they're into it, they're into it, they're into it. And after a while... Jesus turns his attention to Peter. He says, launch out into the deep and let down your net for a catch. Now, I want you to think about this. Jesus is not a fisherman. Who is a fisherman? Peter. It's like me going to LeBron James and saying, LeBron, you can make better baskets if you turn your wrist this way and put the ball. Does that even make sense? No. no. He's going to say, who are you? Why are you telling me that? Right? At the end of the day, Jesus was not supposed to be given instructions. Because these were career fishermen. Jesus was telling them to do what was considered almost impossible. Impossible. Think about it. I'm not a big fisherman. And I know if you go in the night, you have a better chance of catching fish. Why? The fish can't see, right? The fish can't see the net they're going to go in. It's quiet on the water. Everything is better for fishing at night. Jesus is now asking them to go fish 
in the day. Doesn't make sense. Doesn't make sense. You know, I've, I've had my own situation. I, we were living in Bermuda. We were living in Bermuda and, uh, I, you know, I, I always see these guys by the side of the water with their, with their line and their hooks and, you know, doing their fishing. They're surrounded by the sea, small place. So, you know, I figured this is something nice to do. And so, after work, I went to the store, one store that sells fishing equipment, and I got my equipment. And I bought a little hat to go with it. And I put on a nice polo shirt, and a nice sneakers, and a short pants. I was ready to fish. I was ready to fish. Before that, I also went over by KFC, and I got some K Kentucky Fried Chicken for bait. Got KFC for bait. Because I was going to fish. And I said to my wife the evening after lunch, I said, I'm not coming home unless I catch a fish. And we left out just about, a friend of mine and I, we left out just about nightfall. Because when do you fish? Night. Night. So I waited until night. I put the... I, I, I got my equipment and I put it in the car and I was out and I started fishing. But how many of you know you have to have a lot of patience to fish? Yeah, I, I didn't realize that. So I sat there and nothing is tugging. It's just not happening. So I said, okay, let me pull it up. The KFC was gone. So I put more KFC and I push it out a little further. Nothing. So I said, you know what, let me change spots. So I drove to another area and I did the same thing again. Brethren, nothing. Nothing. No fish. It's now 10 o'clock at night. And, and you guys remember what I said to Dahlia? I'm, I'm not coming home. So I said, you know what, let me change one more spot. I know I've seen fish going along here in the day. I know fish come by here. So about 10, 30 minutes to 11, I go there. And at some point, I, I began to figure that maybe my bait was not, not the right bait. But I tried again. And at 11.30, brethren, I'm, I'm just going to be honest with you, I slid and I took my time and I went back home empty-handed. <laughs> I tried not to wake up my wife. I, I tiptoed into the bed. So I know what Peter went through when he said, we have toiled all night and we have caught nothing. You know, husbands, men, it's like when your wife, you know, they must be saying, Jesus, Jesus is so wrong here. Why is he telling us to go fish in the day? It's like when your wife is saying, you know what, you're not driving properly and you know that you're the best driver anywhere in the GTA. You know, it's, it's when somebody is trying to tell you how to do your job. And you know how to do your job. How do they come off trying to tell you what to do? Or you have some little young kids on the job who think they know it all. And you're like, where do they come off trying to tell me what to do? This was the situation. I can imagine Peter was saying in his mind, why is God even trying? You know very much we are the same way. God says, stick with that marriage. And you're like, Lord, do you see what I'm going through with this person? Do you see the sleepless nights? Do you see how abusive? God is saying, stick with it. That job that, that job that is driving you crazy, and that manager that you have to go to every morning, and you're saying, oh, Lord Jesus, how long? And God is saying, stick with it. 
or that, that child that you have that is driving you up the wall and you don't know where else to turn. Or young people, it's that parent that you're saying, why did I get this parent? When, can, when will they understand me? And this was exactly what was happening. Peter was frustrated. But I want you to know that very often when we give up, is just the point when God is about to bless us. Just at the point when we throw in the towel, if we had just hanging there just a little while longer, God would have given us a supernatural blessing. Amen. I'm happy Peter didn't give up. I'm happy Peter didn't say to Jesus, Jesus, I know what I'm doing. Leave this to the professional. Instead, Peter said, verse 5, And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, it means that despite all of what I've said before, what I'm about to say is more important. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. I want you to think about your level of obedience to God. Ever so often we try to do things our way. We try to do things our way. Uh, today someone has toiled all night. You have tried your way and it has not worked. Today you need to say nevertheless. Even though I don't know if what you're saying makes sense. I'm going to do it your way. I'm going to do it God's way. You see, we serve a God who very often doesn't make sense. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Yeah, we serve a God who is extraordinary. He doesn't go by our time frame. You know, the story is told of a man. Man was very frail, very weak, very sickly, would cough very often, had a very, very small chest. One night he was sleeping, he got a vision. He got a vision. God spoke directly to him. The vision was, move that big rock. Sorry, go push that very big rock that's out the front of your house. And he started pushing it in his sleep and he started pushing it in his sleep and he woke up and he said wow that was an interesting vision so he started pushing in the morning he went out to the big rock he lived near to the ocean he started pushing the rock he got tired he went back inside he took a break he drank some juice and he went back outside and he pushed the rock Days went by, he went out again, he pushed the rock. He said, you know what? My problem is consistency. Let me push this rock more consistently. He pushed and he pushed and he pushed. Morning, noon, evening, he would go out and he would push. After about eight to ten weeks, he looked at the rock. And he realized that the rock had not moved the man got mad sorry the man got very upset <laughs> with God he got mad he said Lord you wasted my time you had me trying to push a rock that you know could not move you know this rock could this rock is so big it could not be moved and I'm pushing and I'm here every day pushing and I'm not seeing any results. Then the Lord spoke to him and said, I told you to push the rock, not move the rock. And then the man was like, but that doesn't make any sense. And then God said to him, go and look in the mirror. 
when he looked in the mirror, he realized that he had some big abs, some big chest. His shoulder got broader. His muscles, his biceps, his triceps got bigger. He was no longer coughing. He was healthier. He was stronger. He was more muscular. What made the difference? He was pushing on the rock. The aim was not to move the rock. The aim was to change him. God wants to change you and I. It's not about your circumstances. It's not about your situation. Those are just means to an end. God wants to use those things to change you and I. So ever so often we get it twisted. We want God to remove the problem. The problem is there to make us better. To make us stronger. That teacher that is giving you a hard time is there to make you prepared for that manager. That husband is preparing you for God's kingdom. Because by the time you're finished and he sees God in you, you are both going to be ready for the kingdom. Amen. Will somebody say amen? amen? Whatever you're going through is not about you. It's about God. Amen. And so the disciples made their way back out to sea, paddling their boat. I want you to notice the interesting fact. Jesus said, launch out in the deep. There is something special about fishing in the deep. When I look in the days on shallow water, I see some ticky ticky. I, I, I don't know if you understand. Sorry. You see some very small miniature fish. Is somebody following me? Shallow water is for baby fish. But when you want to see the real nice, big, meaty fish, you have to go out deep. Going out deep also comes with some risk. Because it's okay when you're paddling and you can touch the bottom of the water. You can touch the sand. But when you get out in deep waters and you can't see the bottom, you know that the only thing you can do is depend on God. Amen. God was saying to the disciples, I don't want you to be in the shallow. I want you to go out deep. I want you to go where you need to let go and let God. Today, God is asking you to let go of your circumstances. Let go of your shallow plans and put your hands in the hand of God. He's asking you to launch out in the deep. This church has some great plans, but you guys have to get bigger. You have a $100,000 goal last year, you hit it off. You have to put on even 10 or 20%. Come on. This goal is not about you. Who is giving you the money? God. Amen. God is giving you the money. And so if you made 100,000 this year, come on, 120, 150. Because you serve a big God who is saying, launch out in the deep. Launch out in the deep. I'm, I'm, I'm always talking to the folks the, 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 the pioneer members at Apple Creek because they didn't always have a nice big edifice and I always like success stories so I talked to them I said how did you guys do it how did you guys do it they said we were a small church just like everybody else but the brethren were united the brethren were faithful I said what do you mean they said folks took out second jobs just for the church 
Now, now I can't wrap my head around that. You are going to work a second job and all of that salary goes to the building of your church. Talk about faithfulness. Talk about being serious about God's work. That's what they did. Guys would leave their day jobs and work until 12 midnight at church because they were serious about building the house of God. Amen. Faithfulness. Faithfulness. What if Peter had not gone back out? What if Peter had said, you know what, Lord? I've had a rough night. And I'm not going. I realize the experience that Peter had is the experience you and I have every day of our lives. God says, give me 10%. You say, you know what, God? The bills are big this month. I am giving you no percent. God says, do it this way. We say, you know what, God? I'm doing it my way. God says, worship me on this day of the week. We say, you know what, God, that's not very convenient. I have to work Friday night, and I have to work Sabbath. Elder Joe was right. I thought he was looking at my sermon. Stewardship is not about money. No, 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 I'm, I'm being honest with you. Money is the last part of stewardship. Stewardship is faithfulness to God. Can, can I just be real with you? Faithfulness to God is the true meaning of stewardship. And I want you to think, if you don't get anything else, I shudder just saying it. If you're not faithful to God... you're very often not faithful in any other aspect of your life. Mercy. Think about it. Think about it. If you're not faithful to God, if, 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 you, can't, if you can't do for God what your commitment to him is, and I'm not even talking about money. I'm just saying, if you're not faithful to God, if you're lying, you're stealing, you're doing everything you shouldn't be doing, you are not going to be faithful in any other area of your life. Because it's not about the money. It's not about the money. So the Bible tells us that God tells them, launch out in the deep. Launch out in the deep. By telling them to launch out in the deep, God is saying, make some big plans. Have some big goals. Have some goals that stretch you so far that they seem impossible to achieve. And listen, if you don't do it for yourself, you're not going to understand what Elder Joseph and Sister Coley and, and the others are trying to do. You're not going to get it. You have to get it in your personal life. You have to get that peace with God right first. Because you're going to say, he's a madman. Yeah, that's what you're going to say. You're going to say, we don't need another church. Yeah, you know, the church isn't full. Why are we going somewhere? Let's just enjoy it here. But if you're reading the God of the Bible... And if you're reading what God has done for his people from Genesis to Revelation, you see that we serve a big God. Amen. When they were building that Old Testament temple, what did Moses have to say? Stop. 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 You've given, you're given too much. You're given too much. 
Why were they given too much? They were in relationship with God and they were blessed. They were blessed. When Israel obeyed God, they were blessed. When they did not obey God, they got into problems. Our problem is that we're not doing what he tells us to do. And until we start doing what God tells us to do, we're going to have problems. We're going to have problems. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to give this kind of message, but I'm just saying it's just the truth. It's the word of God. It's the word of God. And so they went back out in the sea. They went back out even though, even though they were tired, even though they didn't feel like it, even though they didn't know what would happen. They still went back out. And the Bible tells us that, the Bible tells us that they, they basically got the biggest catch of their entire life. Sister White tells us we have nothing to fear for the future except we forget the way the Lord has led us in the past. We have nothing to fear for the future except we forget the way God has led us in the past. We have nothing to be afraid of. We should be looking for the biggest building anywhere in the GTA. Why? Because the cattle on a thousand hills belong to our God. We should say, you know what, we're going to make 200,000 this year. Why? Because a big goal is going to stretch us further. And when you get stretched, you get bigger. You grow to fit the situation. You, you know, when, when we got married, we had Alex, life was okay, but things were tight. Things were tight. Things were tight. We both had good jobs, but yeah, you're helping people and you're doing this and you're doing that, and you just have just enough to get by. And then one day, Dahlia sat me down. I was, I, I remember it like yesterday. I just came in from work. We were, we were living in Bermuda. I just sat down on the bed, just came in. Uh, Dahlia says, Junior, sit down. I'm like, what did I do? Because you know, the guys are always in trouble, right? So I said, I'm sorry. She's like, yeah. So, so, so I sat there and, and she's like, <clears throat> I have something to tell you. So she said, sit down. So I sat down. She said, we're having twins. Brethren, it's a good thing I was sitting down. <laughs> I just fall back on the bed. I just fell back because I'm like, Lord, have mercy. What are we going to do? So you have one formula one baby bottle, one car seat. This now turns to three. Three. How do you manage? And daily, I, I won't even say it's me. You know how some husbands and wives are on the same page to not be as generous to God and to the church? My wife is not like that. So she's like, Take out the tithes and offering. And I'm like, but we don't take out the tithe. You, 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 can I be real with you? Yeah, there's some months when you're like, this is tight. But Dale is like, no, 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 take it out. You never ever mess with God's money. Because once you take care of God, God takes care of you. I have seen it over and over and over again. Amen. Let me tell you. Immediately as the twins, immediately as the twins are born, the principal calls me and we need a coach for soccer. I say, I'll coach it. 
And that comes with an extra $500 or thereabout. And after that, they say, we need somebody to, um, we need somebody to um, help with the, to, to lead out with the social studies um, examination council. I said, okay, I'll do that. That's some extra money right there again. And then they say, you know what? We need somebody to write on educational issues for the newspaper. And I said, okay, I'll do that too. <laughs> and God just kept blessing and blessing and blessing. And then there was this scenario, this scenario in which when I started working, I had just finished my master's from Andrews. So <clears throat> I gave in my documentation after a year or so. And somehow I'm working, I'm working, I'm working. And I totally, brethren, I, I, just, I just wasn't watching how much I was being paid. You know, I'm working hard, I'm trying to make other sources of income. And when I'm about to finish my tenure, to move to Canada, somebody told me, check, check your pay stub. So you know, I just called the office and I said to the ladies, I said, you know, can, can you just check to see if I've been paid properly? I realized that for like eight years, they had not calculated the fact that I had a master's degree. And so I got, I got a blessing, brethren. I got, I got a blessing. And this is where Delia say, you see God's blessing? When you trust God, when you trust God and you're faithful to God and you do his will, you can't beat God's giving. And so because Peter went back out and because he put down his net, God was able to bless him to the point where the net was overflowing, to the point where it broke, was about to break. By the way, tell me, what changed? Did the, did the boat change? Did, did, did the fishermen change? No, the fishermen didn't change. It was the same boat. It was the same fishermen. Was it a different sea? Same sea, same water, same lake. What changed? Instructions. They were on divine assignment. If God leads you to it, he will find a way to bring you through it. Whatever he tells you to do, do it. I think about Jesus when he was starting his ministry. He's at this wedding. He's at this wedding, his first wedding. So he goes to the wedding he hasn't even started his ministry as yet. He's just chilling. He's just drinking some fruit juice. And he's just saying hi to the bride and the groom. Are you following me? He's just minding his own business. All of a sudden, his mother comes to him. The wine has run out. Now, back in those days, that's a big deal. Because it's all about having the festivities with grape juice. Yes. So here we go, no wine. And they're just starting the celebration. Mary calls the servants and she says to them, here is Jesus. Whatever he, tells, he says to do, do it. Jesus is like, but my time has not. Whatever he says to you, do it. So Jesus says, fill 
the water pots. Now again, Jesus doesn't make sense. What, what did they want? Wine. So, so you're telling them to fill the water pots with water. So I imagine one of them whispered, this guy doesn't have a clue what he's doing. We don't want H2O. We want non-alcoholic LCBO. And then the other one whispers, but remember what his mother said. Whatever he says to do, do it. And so, and so they fill the water pots. And I don't know when it happens, but magically at some point, everything changes. Everything changes. Water is no longer water, but it is the purest form of grape juice wine. What a mighty God we serve. You have your testimonies. You know how God has provided for you. You know how you came to this country with no money in your pocket. And now you have a car and you have a house and money in the bank. Yes. Who could it be but the Lord? Amen. You don't have no more skills than anybody else. You don't have anything extra than anybody else. All you have is the word of God. Amen. Number one, whatsoever he tells you to do do it you cannot go wrong when you obey god Amen. be obedient to the will of god it might not be comfortable you might not see the way out you might not even know which land you're gonna buy or where you're gonna build a church just be faithful in your giving to god have your family worship every morning. Bring your family to God in prayer. Do what he says you're to do. You know, very often our ego gets in the way. That's why God can't bless us. Think about Naaman. Naaman has leprosy. Right? He's going to die. He goes to the man of God. The man of God doesn't even come out to him. He sends the messenger and says, go dip in the Jordan seven times. How dare you tell me a big warrior to go dip in dirty water? Do you know who I am? Do you know my position? Do you know how many gifts I have on this chariot for you? You know, it's how we turn up our nose on somebody who collects the garbage not realizing that that person on that truck makes more money than the average person in the GTA sure. did you know that yeah. yeah yeah or it's a person who sits at home watching TV for 10 hours or 6 hours every night and they haven't read a book in 3 years you can't do that you're a child of God. Use your brain better. You're watching guys who are making millions of dollars playing basketball and you don't have a dollar. And then you say you're a Christian Sabbath morning, you dress up in suit. And you can't give an offering to the church building fund. You're not living for God when you do that. God says, be faithful. Use your time to the best of your ability. As God's people, we're the head and not the tail. We are bought with a price. We're here as representatives of God's kingdom. This church should lack nothing. Because we have everything we need to be saved and to help others to make it to God's kingdom. Let's not wait till we have it. Let's make the goals, make the plans, and step out in Jesus' name. You know, I close with the other part of the story. The second, the second, the third, the second phase of the story is when Jesus had died and, and had been risen and was at the close of his earthly ministry. He said to them, cast your net 
on the other side. You and I have been doing some things the same way on the same side. You know what insanity is? Doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. That's insanity. Because it didn't work last year. And you're going back 2019 to do the same thing. God is saying, cast your net on the other side. Try it my way. Do it a little bit differently this year. When you do that, you will realize that God is faithful. God will put the fish in your net. God will make a way where there seems to be no way. God is faithful. His word is true. If you trust and obey, you will realize that there is nothing that you and God cannot accomplish. I close with Psalm 121. I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help comes from the Lord who makes heaven and earth. He will not allow my foot to slip. He who keeps Israel neither slumber nor sleeps. The Lord is my keeper. The Lord is my shade upon thy right hand. The sun will not smite me by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will protect you from all evil. He will protect your soul. He will protect your going out and your coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. May God bless us as we remain faithful to him. God bless you.